Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill is the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at DrPatientMovie.com. Hey, welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and each episode, we dive into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research, empowering you with knowledge and wisdom to overcome illness and in your journey to optimal health. Uh, hey guys, if you don't already know, if you've been around me at all, you know my movie, Dr. Patient is now out. You can view it, share it, gift it, rent it at drpatientmovie.com. Be sure and check it out. And then I would love to hear your feedback after you've had a chance to watch it today. I am deeply honored to have guest Bruce Lippman here with me. He's a PhD cell biologist and lecturer and internationally recognized leader in bridging science and spirit. We were just talking before we came on on how he has been a leader decades before a lot of us in functional integrative medicine came along. And I am so excited. If you're a doctor listening, I know I have a lot of audience there. You are in for a treat. If you're a patient, you're also in for a treat. Stay tuned. Um, Bruce is a uh, faculty in the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and later performed groundbreaking stem cell research at Stanford University. He's a best-selling author of The Biology of Belief. If you haven't read that book, it's a classic now. The Honeymoon Effect and the co-author with Stephen Behrman of Spontaneous Evolution. Bruce received his 2009 prestigious Go Peace Award from Japan in honor of his scientific contribution to world harmony. Bruce, it is a true honor and delight to have you here. Jill, I am a happy person to be here because this audience that I get a chance to talk to, to me, is a very important audience. These are the cultural creatives that are paving a way for the future that we need to get into very soon uh, because we're facing an evolutionary upheaval at this very moment. Uh, whether you watch the news, surf the web, or even look out your window, the whole planet is experiencing chaos at every level of it. Uh, and people are focusing on the little chaos, like focusing on the trees without pulling back to see the biggest thing that's happening. And nobody's saying the words is, well, NASA. Let me just say NASA's words. NASA has recognized that within the next 20 years, Civilization is facing, and this is my emphasis here, civilization is facing an irreversible collapse. And the reason is so mathematically simple. Let me give the math. Sure. Science has recognized that today, that to continue living just the way we're living, to say, let's every day just live the way we're living today on this planet. It takes 1.6 planet Earth to provide the resources for today's civilization. Well, the simple math is this, there's one Earth, subtracted from 1.6, and we're recognizing, where the hell are we getting the extra points? We're in a deficit. <laughs> and that deficit is actually leading to a destruction of the web of life. And we have to also recognize this, uh, even though the Bible has given us some fanciful story that nature was created, then humans were like added on top of nature, 
No, we evolved from nature. We are nature. If nature goes down, humans go down because we are part of this web of life. And the reality is our separation in our consciousness that we can dominate nature. And I say, well, how's that working? I say, well, we're facing an extinction. That's a biological reality at this moment. It's called a mass extinction. Happened uh, uh, five times in the history of this planet. Life was thriving, mass extinction. Knocked it all out, and then it started again. We are there because of our behavior. And I say our behavior is based on um, our consciousness. And I go, okay, wait a second. Is that the new age? I go, no, let's stop. No new age here at this moment. 1927, day one, quantum physics. Max Planck, founding father of quantum physics, states the mind is the creator of our life experiences. Quantum physics, the most valid of all the sciences today in the sense of its predictions and accuracy, quantum physics. And uh, it's still the same belief in quantum physics. Consciousness is controlling this. And I go, so if consciousness is controlling this, then why are we in such a mess? And the answer is, we have been programmed. And the programming has disempowered us all. It has disempowered us as patients. I go, how do, I'll give you a program that disempowers you right now. I say, what is it? It's called genetic determinism. That was what I was teaching in medical school. Genes control the character of life. I go, did we pick the genes as far as we know? No. Uh, but if we don't like the characters we have, can we change the genes? No, can't do that. And then let's just add a little tidbit. Genes turn on and off by themselves. And I say, you put those together, and I say, what have you done? You have told the patient that their life is not in their control. It's a control by their heredity, and that they're victims of heredity, which is victims of what? Genetics. And what does a person know about genetics? Nothing. Who does know something? The doctor. <laughs> ha! The program is, when it comes to health, people do not trust themselves. They say, uh, I need expert opinion. I, I'm not knowledgeable. They accept the truth from somebody else. So, Excuse I, me, but this, yes, Joe, please. I was going to say, I, I so love the direction that you're going here because as a physician, I, one of the most important things I can do is empower the patient and make sure that they don't think that I am the end all be all, that we are collaborating and that I actually listen to them and say, how do you feel about this treatment plan? Where do you want to go? What do you, and granted, if I have wisdom, I can give them that information, but they still get to make that decision. But so many patients are outsourcing that wisdom to someone they think, or at least paternalistically, historically, that has been the way, right? And what we need to do is actually take control of our own health. And I really love, you know how many patients have gone through a, a loved one with breast cancer. I'm a breast cancer survivor, so I can speak on this. And they're told you have the BRCA gene and you need to have a bilateral mastectomy. And I'm going to be strong about this because I, I disagree. Now, that's an action out of fear, right? What happens here now to each his own. So if you've been out there and you've done something based on your genetics, there's no judgment here. But what we're saying is that you actually have control over the expression of those genes. So why don't you go into epigenetics for those who don't know what that means and tell us like a little primer on epigenetics and why we actually have more control than we think. Okay, most important thing, and this is all scientific, so this is not any new age BS here, folks. This is science. So I say, what is it? Well, the belief that genes turn on and off is a complete false statement because a gene is a blueprint to make a protein. The proteins are the building blocks. Proteins wear out, you have to replace them. So you have to have a blueprint. It's called a gene. I go, it's a blueprint. I go, why is that relevant? I said, well, go to an architect's office and she's working on a blueprint. You ask her, you say, hey, is your blueprint on or off? And she would look at you like, what are you talking about? There's no on and off to a blueprint. I go, aha, aha. A gene is a blueprint. What you want to find out is who's the architect that reads the blueprint. The blueprint does not read itself. There's an architect. I saw this in my research, 1967. None of you were probably old enough to know what I'm talking about, 1967. But I was cloning stem cells. Stem cells, let's give the real name of a stem cell, embryonic cell. Mm -hmm. It's an embryo cell. It replaces things that are broken and get a new one. I go, so what? Well, I clone a stem cell. I say, what's that? I say, you put one stem cell in the culture dish. And then what? Well, it divides every 10 or 12 hours. So first there's one, then there's two, then there's four, eight, 16. 
A week later, 30,000 cells in the Petri dish. What's the most important fact? They all came from one parent. I have 30,000 genetically identical cells. <clears throat> I split them into three Petri dishes. One, two, three. So each dish has 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, all genetically the same. And we grow cells in culture medium. Ah, this is going to be the tricky part. For when you get this, the world changes. Yes. I'm going to come back to it. I say culture medium is what the cells grow in, in in the lab. And I make it up by putting the chemistry or culture medium. And since I'm creating it, I can change some of the constituents. So I make three different versions of culture medium, A, B, and C. So I say, so what? Well, each one represents a different environment because the cells live in culture medium. So I say, okay, <clears throat> dish one. Environment A, the cells form muscle. Dish two, environment B, the cells form bone. Dish three, environment C, the cells form fat cells. I'm doing this experiment. I'm teaching genetic determinism, and I'm watching the cells and going, wait a second. Wait a second. Who controlled the activity? They were all genetically the same. What was different? The environment. The chemistry of the environment selected the genes. The genes did not select themselves. Then all of a sudden I said, well, why is this important? It's a revolution. I'll tell you why. Genetic determinism, victim. Yes. The new science, epigenetics, which I'll explain, master. Why? Because you control the environment. Yes. It's the environment that controls the cells. That's what it's called epigenetics. Simple reason why the name. What do we call skin? Epidermis. Why? What's under the skin? Layer called dermis. What's skin? Above the dermis. Epidermis. Epi. Above. <clears throat> Epigenetics. Control above the genes. I go, whoa. The control is not in the genes? No, it's a control of the environment that the genes live in. I go, well, wait. I control the environment. Aha! If you control the environment, then you control the genetics. And that's all of a sudden where the new science comes in. The genetic determinism victim, epigenetics master. You control your genes, okay? So basically, what I saw back in 1967 was the genes didn't make this decision. Now, let's just jump ahead a second here, because that's a basic science. And then I'm going to give you this, which you're totally aware of. You are a skin-covered Petri dish. You have 50 trillion cells under your skin, and you have the original culture medium. What is culture medium? I didn't say it before, but I'll tell you what it is. Laboratory version of blood. So when I grow human cells, I concoct a, a, a culture medium based on the constituents of human blood or Mouse blood, or depending on which cells I'm growing. So what's the point? Well, you are skin-covered culture dish with what? The original culture medium. Yeah. You have the blood. The blood carries the chemistry, which activates the genes. Okay? So first point, scientifically, does it make a difference if the cell is in a plastic dish or a skin dish? I said, no, it's the environment. Yes. And I say, the environment in your body is the blood for the cells. And then comes two questions that then blow the game into a new evolution. Question number one, well, what controls the chemistry of the blood? The answer is the brain. Yes. It's the chemist. Okay? The big one. Here it is. Hold on. So what chemistry should the brain put into the blood? <laughs> you know what it is? Whatever picture you hold in your mind, the brain translates the picture into complementary chemistry that matches the picture. I say, so why is this important? The picture in your head becomes material in your body. You manifest what you're thinking. I go, well, well wait a minute. <laughs> Would I manifest this life? Would I manifest my cancer? I go, well, yes. I go, you say that with such affirmative you know, saying, and I go, oh, quantum physics, most valid science principle, number one, the mind is the creator of our experience. I go, well, 
Epigenetics is the biological component of that physics mechanism. Epigenetics is how the mind adjusts the genetics of the body. And I go, well, we're facing a healthcare crisis on this planet. I go, yeah, we are facing a healthcare crisis. And I go, uh, what's responsible? Well, we put all the money into the science. You know what we're looking for? Looking for the gene, the gene that controls that problem. Well, guess what? Less than 1% of all disease on this planet has any connection with genes. Well, wait, then that means only less than 1% of what we diagnose as disease is connected to genes. I go, yes, that's a fact. Then what can is really contributing to the worldwide crisis in healthcare? And the answer is stress is 90% the cause of disease minimum. I go, okay, come on. How could that do that? Well, let's give the biology because it's not new age again. You ready? When you're in stress, you're in threat. When you're in threat, you engage a protection response. I say, what is a protection response? Well, the protection response is when you perceive a stress, you will release uh, stress hormones, adrenal hormones. I go, yeah, so what? Well, what do you think the adrenal hormones do? They prepare the body for fight or flight. I go, so what? I say, well, first of all, there are three stages to take a body from health, happiness, joy, I'm in the garden, I love my life, to, ah, cyber two, saber two tigers chasing me. I say, so I have to switch from growth boom, yep. into protection. Yes. So how does that happen? Yes. Three steps. Number one, stress hormones cause the blood vessels in the gut to constrict. Why? Because most of the blood is in the gut. And I say, who cares? I say, ah, but the blood is a source of energy. So if you need energy, you need blood. So I say, so what's the point? I say, well, most of the blood's in the gut, taking care of the body, cleaning, fixing, repairing, you know, nourishing, doing all those things. But the moment stress hormones come in, the blood vessels squeeze shut. People feel it in the body. It's queasy. I feel very queasy when I'm in fear like this. And I say, but some people say butterflies in the stomach. Why? The fluttering of the blood vessels shutting down. You can feel it, and it's a fluttering. And what's happening? The blood is being pushed to the arms and legs. And that's where I need to run away from that damn tiger, you know? So number one, redistribute the blood. Where do I take it from? Growth and maintenance to protection. So I'm not funding growth and maintenance when I'm running from the tiger. I go, no, you're not. Okay. Number two, the immune system is to protect me on the inside. If I'm being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, then what's the value of the immune system? Well, I, I give you a scenario. Come on, docs, listen to this. Patients got a bacterial infection. They're going to have a real bad case of diarrhea coming up here, and they're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. How would you split the energy of the body? How much to support the immune system, and how much of that energy to run away from the saber-toothed tiger? I'll give you a second. Okay, thank you. The answer is, of course, who cares about the immune system? If the tiger catches you, the bacteria are not your problem anymore, that's for sure. So, listen, stress hormones shut down the immune system yes. to conserve energy. And you know damn well when people are sick, sometimes they don't even have the energy to get out of bed because the immune system uses a hell of a lot of energy. So if you're being chased by a tiger... I can't support the immune system because if the tiger gets me, who cares about what's happening in the interior? It's not mine anymore. So it's so important, fact, therapeutic, when they transplant an organ from person A into person B and they don't want immunological rejection, they give the recipient stress hormones before the operation. That restricts the function of the immune system so it doesn't immediately reject the foreign graft. Ah, so stress hormones are used therapeutically to shut off the immune system. So I say, yeah, what do you think stress does? Automatically. That's number two. Number three, conscious processing is slow compared to reflex behavior. Conscious is like, oh, let me think. Uh, reflex is boom. <laughs> boom, like that. Point is, if you're running from a saber-toothed tiger, conscious processing is going to delay your immune system, uh, your nervous system, because you'll be thinking. It's like, you know, you, when that tiger is coming, guess what? Remember the role of the stress hormones squeeze the blood vessels here? They squeeze the blood vessels in the forebrain. 
I say, why? Because it stops the blood flow from going to the conscious mind. Where's it going? Mind brain, reflex behavior. Result, we become less intelligent in a fear process. And so I say, so let's put these all together. I shut down growth, I shut down the immune system, and I shut off conscious awareness. I go, well, look, when was that system formed? Oh, a couple hundred thousand years ago. I say, what was it responding to? The saber-toothed tiger. I go, so what was important? If you escape that tiger five minutes, 10 minutes, there's no more saber-toothed tiger, no more stress. So it was used for five, 10 minutes. Shut it down, five, 10 minutes, we'll come back later. Today's world, 24, well, you know the whole thing. Yeah. Yes. Every day, every minute, we're in stress. Yes, The system was never designed for chronic stress. It shuts down the vitality, the health, and the maintenance of the body. The stresses of this world are responsible for over 90% of healthcare crises. This is recognized by the American Psychological Society. 95% of visits to doctor's office is stress-related. Okay, so the idea is we have been programmed as medical and I was a programmer, and yeah. I'm not proud now because what I programmed, people used to believe genetic determinism. I go, no, no I was wrong. <laughs> Epigenetics, okay? But but so, we've been programmed to be victims. Yes, and finally, first of all, I think doctors are starting, at least in my realm of functional education, are starting, we're talking epigenetics, we're, we're using this. And I just want to share a personal example to bring this home of what you just uh, shared. It's so important. So many of my listeners know I at 25, I had breast cancer, then Crohn's disease, then autoimmunity, and I'm the poster child. And what I remember very clearly was in my 30s, I got mold-related toxicity. My immune system was terribly trashed and and overactive, and I was under high stress. I remember one day walking along and realizing this stress that is in my body is actually killing me. And I had gone from the mentality, beating cancer, fighting cancer, fighting this, fighting that, fighting, 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 which is your saber tooth tiger, right? I was in fight or flight. The day I realized that was the day I realized I could also reprogram my immune system through my thoughts. And I literally that day started thinking a new paradigm, thinking about these little yellow minions being my immune system. They were helping the escort um, all the mold toxicity out of my body without this fight because fight or flight, there's no healing. And now today I'm healed from that and healed from mold related illness and all of this. But it's really that, that moment when I realized I could change my thought process, change the function of my immune system, recover from Crohn's cancer, toxic mold, and no longer fight. And the most important message is as you brought home is when I'm sitting with a patient, if they're in fear, if they are in um, fight or flight, if they are feeling unsafe in their body, there is no amount of pills, supplements, IVs, nutrition, or even good advice that I can give them unless they go to that place of unsafe, to that place of fear, to that place where they're still somatically running from the tiger, right? That we have to change that. And it starts with this. So I love, love, love that you frame this. And I just want to, again, give you credit because you've been doing this work for decades before anyone else was talking about it. And now we're seeing, and finally docs in my field are starting to acknowledge and talk about it. But even in my field, functional medicine, it's a lot about supplements and diet and lifestyle. That's all great. But well, that's you, environment. Right, right. And actually that's the thing I was going to mention too. My specialty is environmental toxicity. And, and so I know the Petri dish of how it affects our bodies. Um, but I do believe, as you're saying that this really reprogramming of our mind, do you have any stories or examples or, or maybe from your book of, of maybe a, a patient or a client or somebody who's read your book that really took this and changed? Huh. Their I got, I've got hundreds and hundreds of letters of people who've written that they, once they understood this, there was two things about this. Let me express it even in my personal life. I understood this from a scientific point of view, man, bro, it was in my laboratory, my research. It was like repeatable. I could do this all the time. And I extended this over. It took 23 years before science caught up with that observation. Right. I made a lot of other things in between to conform. Uh, and the reality is that um, our own understanding about our, our, our frailty is, is, is it's a neat understanding. And then I give an understanding of, no, we're very powerful. So I was so happy to go and find an audience of docs and people. Let me explain how to create the most wonderful life. Here's the science. 
And then they come to my lecture and they look at me and they go, Lipton, your, your life doesn't look that good for a guy who says you know this. Oh, my God. I was caught. You know what it was? Talking the talk, not walking the talk. I knew the science. It was in my head. Yes. Did I make it part of my life? No. I say, so what was the point? I don't care how smart you are. If you don't make it part of your life, it's irrelevant. <laughs> I was totally. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, when I caught myself going, oh, do as I say, not as I do, it's like, I can't do that. So I had to say, stop lecturing. Start living your life with the principles you are telling other people. Live this now. How long did it take me to change my life? Oh, within a month, my life was completely in a whole different spectrum. And it was like, now, of course, I started talking about it again because it was real. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's really, let me just give a, a simple understanding, a scientific understanding, and that is this. The mind is not one thing. Oh, the mind. I go, no, not the mind. There are two minds. And they're interdependent. But they have different functions. The conscious mind, latest evolution, prefrontal cortex, right behind your forehead, the seed of the conscious mind. What's that? The conscious mind is your source, your personal identity, your spiritual place, okay? What else is it? It's creative. That's what makes the humans different than all the other animals. We can take ideas, boom, build them, and create in the conscious mind. What about subconscious mind? Oh, the original one? Hard drive, programs, yes. habits, stored behavior. Thinking? Uh-uh. Just behavior, programs. The subconscious has no way to differentiate truth, right? It does whatever you tell it to do. No, well, the subconscious doesn't do what you tell it to do. It, tell, it does what it tells it to do. The subconscious is the autopilot. I go, so wait. I say, yeah, the, the mind works. But you have to understand, when I'm in the conscious mind, that is the creative side. That's the side with wishes, desires, aspirations. What do you want? Conscious mind. Subconscious mind. Program. I say, so what's the issue with our life? And it comes down to the monkey wrench that blows the whole thing out is when the conscious mind is thinking, it's not paying attention to the outer world. A thought is inside. When you're present, your conscious mind is looking at the world and engaging the world right now in front of it. I'm engaging it. But if I'm thinking, my conscious mind is no longer looking out. It's looking in because a thought is on the inside. So I said, well, wait, what if I'm driving the car and I have a thought and I got to tell you a fact? Then you're not driving the car. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? You know, I, I no accident or nothing. I, I said, driving is a program. <laughs> you, could, you don't have to think about driving. In fact, you, most of the time, if you've been driving for a long time, you never think about the details of driving. It's an automatic behavioral program. It plays when you're not paying attention. I go, aha! When the conscious mind is thinking... It's not paying attention to the outer, outer world. Why? It's inside. So I said, but what are you walking, driving, talking, doing your job? Hey, those are habits. You've been doing it all, whatever, a long period of time. You, you don't have to relearn it. It's automatic. You even have to think about walking. No, you don't even have to say, oh, I'm going to walk from here to there. It's not, I'm going to get that. <laughs> I said, walking, automatic. You don't think about it. Program. So then comes the number, and this is scientific. 95% of the day is the average person's amount of thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, then what does that represent? Biologically, then only 5% of the day are you creating your life with the conscious mind's wishes and desires. 95% of the day, your life is coming from programs that you downloaded mainly before age seven. And I go... Where did I get the programs? I go, before age seven, your brain is primarily functioning not at the level of consciousness, which in EEG terms, alpha, beta, gamma. When you're under seven, you're operating primarily at theta, which is just below consciousness. Theta, imagination. Hey, the tea party, pour nothing into the cup, drink the nothing. Best tea I ever had in my life. Yeah. Uh, that's imagination. Well, that's theta. That's what kids do all the time. They can have imaginary friends. They play with them all the time. It's imagination. Theta is hypnosis. I go, why is that important? How many rules does it take to be a member of a family? How many rules does it take to be a member of a community? 
Well, now we're talking thousands. And I go, well, why is that important? I said, well, teach an infant a thousand rules. They go like, they can't read a book. They can't sit in a classroom. They can't you know, understand a video. I said, how are they going to learn? Nature took care of that. Nature gave the first seven years theta, which is hypnosis. You want to know the behavior? Watch your mother. Watch your father. Watch your community. Watch their behavior. Download it. Now it's your behavior. Mm -hmm. So the behavior that's in your subconscious mind didn't even come from you, did it? Nope, it came from other people. And did they answer your wishes and desires what you'd like? Yeah, not necessarily. So then are there programs in there that give you what your wishes and desires are? Not necessarily, no. And in fact, I say, so what, are, what about these programs? 60% of the things you downloaded as a kid, 60% of the subconscious programs, disempowering, self-sabotaging, and limiting beliefs. Yes. And you operate 95% of the day from them. Ah, but here's the monkey wrench you didn't catch. Why am I using my subconscious programs? Because my conscious mind's not paying attention. It's thinking. Well, then, do you see the programs when they come out? And I go, nope. You're the only one who doesn't even see the program. Why? Everybody else around you is responding to your program. You're not even paying attention. What the hell is coming out? 60% of it disempowering yourself. <laughs> and so the issue is this. We are not controlling our lives. Our program controls our lives. I say, oh, this, this is a new science. I go, well, scientifically, this is valid. This is understanding theta activity, downloading programs, conscious, subconscious, blah, 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 blah. But the Jesuits knew about programming for 400 years. They would tell their followers, give me a child until it is seven, and I will show you the man. I guess, oh, my God, that's 100% right. The programming is before age seven, and 95% of the life is the program. They knew it. Mm -hmm. They created Catholic schools to help the programming go along. And that idea is never lost because if you can watch an infant today, which I've seen, carrying an iPad, interacting with a program on a computer, that's far better programming than Jesuits could have ever thought of. <laughs> yeah, it's clear, isn't it? Actually, that's a really good transition because one of the things I see as the biggest crisis in healthcare is environment, but it's environment that is no longer socially interactive or present. And we're numbing ourselves out with machines and with iPads and with phones and with, and they are literally designed to create an addictive behavior. So they're tapping into some of those subconscious programs, right? How? Uh, uh, let you... me just add this to that. It's not just, uh, you know, that behavior, but it, it's also creating programs of more or less disempowering behaviors, okay? Uh, uh, and so the, these programs, as you were just going to say, and I'll get back, let you have it back again. Uh, these programs were not designed to help us. Right. They were designed to control us. Yes, and sell and control. And yeah, so we are being um, a, a pawns in this new world of, of technology that is literally neuro dynamically designed to be addictive. If you haven't seen Social Dilemma, that's a great place to start in your education on, on social media and the impact. So I, I do want to talk about this because I think this being conscious, one of the things you just got to saying is, oh, before seven, we're programmed. I totally understand and believe that. But the truth is we have power to change that programming. Tell us about that. Well, most everybody out there has changed that programming. Mm -hmm. I say, you already done it. I say, what? Well, the movie The Matrix being a documentary, everybody's program. Yeah, of course, that's the foundational belief of the movie and of reality. And in the movie, they offered the red pill. And I say, what was the red pill? You get out of the program. I go, almost everybody out here right now listening has done that. I say, what was the consequence? So how did it happen? So I'm going to tell you. Falling in love is a red pill. I go, what do you mean? Because when you first fall in love, you stop thinking biologically, you stay present. You stay in the conscious, creative mind. You've waited for this person your whole life. They're there. What, you want to start thinking and then ignore them? Are you kidding me? You stay up conscious. The same mindful. And I say, so what happened? I say, your life up to the meeting, that person, blah, 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 blah. You meet them 24 hours later. Oh, man, life is beautiful. Life is so wonderful. Hey, you know, the food's really good. I'm, that music is even better than I ever thought it was. And even the crappy job, not so crappy. I said, what'd you do? You made honeymoon. What's honeymoon? Heaven on earth. I said, well, what was your heaven on earth? Whatever you wished and desired. 
and you and a partner coming together when you're both wishing and desire and you're sharing the same wishes and desires, you manifest a honeymoon. Is the honeymoon... Oops, I dropped something, but okay. Is the honeymoon already there? I go, the honeymoon's always there. I said, then how come you don't have it? Because when you start thinking, you then actually then go back to subconscious control, the default. Yes. And the problem is, why do 50% of marriages end up in divorce? And the answer is this, because marriages started with a relationship of two conscious creative minds sharing together a belief in creating a honeymoon. And it ends when thinking enters into the people and they start them playing their regular programs, which are 60% negative, and the partner hears these programs, the one saying the thing doesn't hear it, the other one hears it. I love the response. When somebody comes out, you know, in a relationship and the, and the loving partner hears some kind of BS come out of their other partner, and they, they look at them and go, who are you? Yeah. Where did you come from? Yeah. Why? It was never part of the behavior. And then all of a sudden it shows up. And the more thinking, the more that negative shows up, there's a point where a partner will say, eh, that's enough. Yeah. You know, that's not why I signed up here. I signed up because we had a great honeymoon. After you started thinking, this thing went <laughs> down the tubes. Right. And well, the point is, that's what reality is about. So the idea then becomes simple, which is the obvious thing. Well, what if I created all programs that represented my wishes and desires? If I had those programs, I'd say, oh, you know what? Whether you're consciously creating those wishes, desires, or your conscious mind is off in left field, your subconscious will be manifesting the wishes and desires. And guess what? A honeymoon is not a short period. A honeymoon is every day of your life for as long as you live. Does it work? Well, personally, I had some very bad programming when I was young because my mother and father had a dysfunctional relationship. I downloaded my father's dysfunctional behavior. I played it when I couldn't see it. The result is I couldn't get relationships off the ground. Then I understood the nature of the programming. Then I understand the nature of reprogramming. And around 50, I met my partner, Margaret. And we just celebrated, uh, what, 28 years. Wow. And I'm not selling just like a relationship. I'm talking honeymoon for 28 years. To wake up every day in my life and go, oh, my God, I'm still here. Yeah. Oh, my God, I have another day to smell the roses, to have the piece of cake, and, and to enjoy the love, and watch the, the environment, and love my life. I celebrate life. Yes, Jill yes. celebrates life. What's the result? Where's the illness? What illness? Yes, yes. No, I, I love that because there's some points that I think are so crucial that you just made. Number one, being present with our partners and watching them in real time and observing them. So often we create a program of them as well, a, a template, and then we don't expect them to change or expect them to behave the same. And then when we're in real time present with another person, whether it's a friend, family member, business associate, or lover, we can actually respond in real time. And that's part of that creation, that co-creation that you're talking about. Crucial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the other thing is that um, with illness, I find one thing that was, and I'm sure this is related to the program. I'd love your comments was I never identified with the cancer. I never be, became the cancer. I never made that part of who I was. Even now I'm like, oh yeah, 20 years ago I had cancer. And of course it's real, but I don't, it's almost like foreign because it was never part of me. And I really believe that's a huge part of why I never, uh, why I overcame a very, very aggressive cancer at the age of 25 was because it never was my identity. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, let's, let's talk about this. The first thing is this, I'm going to give a fact of science, which is my, you know, he's really said that. And I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to say this. There's not one gene that causes cancer. Mm -hmm. There's not a gene. You have this gene, you get cancer. You know, the one scary one for women, of course, the breast cancer gene. I go, so what? I go, women that carry the breast cancer gene don't necessarily have to have cancer. Matter of fact, nearly half of them don't get cancer, yes. but they have the gene. So then I say, then where did the cancer come from? Because those that have the cancer with the gene and those that are healthy with the gene have the same gene. What's the difference? And the answer is this. Cancer is correlated with a uh, with a gene, not caused by a gene. Right. Cancer is caused by disharmony in the system. Mm -hmm. Disharmony is the source of disease. Harmony is the source of health. Disharmony means your programming wasn't really good, <laughs> and you're responding to things in a negative way that are going to cause a breakdown of the system. That's where the stress comes into it. 
So the concept is this, the image, even if once you tell a woman, oh yes, you have the breast cancer gene, what the hell image you think is going to be in her head? And the answer is cancer. I go, yeah, but isn't the function of the mind to take the image of the head and turn it into reality? I go, absolutely. What's the consequence? 90% of cancer has no genetic linkage at all. <laughs> yes, that was the biggest question I got as a 25-year-old. Oh, was there every single person to a T? Oh, did you have genes? No, I didn't have genes. I had a dysfunctional system that was in my 20s, and I, that goes into a whole nother lecture that I could give, but I was not living consciously, and there was some things stress-wise that were contributing and it was environmental toxic load. So all of these things are the Petri dish. And they're more not- than that, there must have been programs, because I'll tell you the two yes. programs, 80 to 90% of all people will not test positive for two beliefs. Number one, and the one, I think the most important, the belief, I love myself. Yes. 80% of the people will not test positive for that belief. Number two, and this is the one where the health care and crisis comes from, I am safe. Yes. Because when you have a picture of fear, then the chemistry of fear is to manifest the fear. Yes. When you have a chemistry of a a tumor that they say, this is it, and the picture of the tumor and everything, then you make the chemistry of the tumor. And the idea is we have to own quantum physics. Consciousness is the source of our life experiences. We have to understand the nature of epigenetics. Yes. Consciousness is the source of what controls our genes. And the the third thing that I think is part of the Renaissance that we really must emphasize at some point is Newtonian physics that separates physical from non-physical. Matter versus energy is an illusion. Yes. It's not real. But it programs us in a very bad way because the program says whatever is made out of matter can only be affected by matter. Whatever is made out of energy can only be affected by energy. And I say, so what's the consequence? I say, the body is matter. And what do you think the whole foundation of the pharmaceutical company is? The body is matter and we make the matter to fix the matter. Yes, yes. What's the matter with that? (laughs) 300,000 people die in the U.S. every year from prescription drugs. That's what's the matter with it. When less than 50,000, I think 30,000 people die from illegal drugs. We have a war on illegal drugs. And 300,000 people dying from pharmaceutical drugs is called the cost of doing medicine. I go, that's damn expensive. We don't need that. Simple law of science. If a drug worked, it only works because you already had a receptor for that drug on your cells. You think nature put receptors on cells waiting for the pharmaceutical company to make a drug? Oh, come on, man. If you have a receptor for a drug, it's because you have a receptor for a drug that you make. And I go, I can make any drug, of course, because any any drug works because you have a receptor to connect it. Well, if you have a receptor, then you obviously have a signal that will bind to that receptor. So, and you say, well, it's not working. And that's where everything gets screwed up because that system isn't working. And then you go right away, oh, the body is defective. The genes aren't working right. There's an interference with the physical. I go, yeah, there was an interference because it didn't start down here. It started up here. And once you start to understand this, yeah, you treat the body if it's, you know, immediate need to treat the body. But the process of treating the patient is treating this part. Knowledge is power. Yes. They do not have the knowledge of who they are. They're programmed. I'm a victim of my genes and I have no power. I go, wow, there's your problem. Uh, and, And the issue about it is you guys are in the front of the evolution that says, Okay, I can treat the patient, but I really got to treat the consciousness of the patient. Why? Because as quantum physics says, consciousness is the source of this creativity. As epigenetic says, consciousness is the source of this expression. You cannot leave that out. And I think the the thing that most physicians, um, and if we don't, if we aren't aware, one of the biggest things we do is you just talk about two beliefs that I think are critical, and it's a great place to kind of wrap up. First one is, do we love ourselves? Do we really, really, truly love and accept ourselves? And I have written a book and done a movie on that message as the heart of healing is how do we show self-compassion and love? Because that is the only way that our cells will actually respond in health. The second thing was so crucial too, and that is the um, fear and the unsafety. 
So if we believe that we're not safe, and this is where a physician in the office can make all the difference because if they add to that fear message, guess what? That's just adding to that patient's unhealth. And so one thing we are obligated to do as physicians is to create a safe environment and teach that patient how to really start to feel safe in their body. With those two beliefs, maybe in the last couple of minutes here, could you give us maybe some practical advice for someone who's like, well, how do I start doing that, Bruce? How do I feel safe in my body? And how do I love myself? Because that I couldn't agree more with you is really the core here, the message. I'll tell you, let's get right to the root of why people do not love themselves. The answer is because parents act like coaches on a sports team. I go, what does that? I go, so the poor, a player isn't doing well. What does the coach say? Oh, do better. No, hell, the coach says, that's not good enough. Who do you think you are? You don't deserve to be on this team. Well, a player is older than seven. They're in consciousness. They understand that the coach is saying, you better do better. Okay, now let's say the parent is the coach and the kid is under seven. There's no consciousness operating. Yeah. What's operating? Hypnosis, programming. So when the father says, that was not good enough, you don't deserve this, you're not lovable, you don't belong, blah, 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 acting like the coach, that this is going to make them do better. If the kid is under seven, you just program them to self-sabotage yes. because the subconscious is going to create 95% of the life. And if I get a, a program I do not deserve, when I'm thinking 95% of the day, what the hell program is running? I do not deserve. So I could say something so stupid in my corporate structure or something, and somebody says, that guy doesn't deserve to be here. And then all of a sudden, I'm kicked out of the structure. Why? Because I myself made behavior to conform to not good enough yes, and to not love myself. And this is why that one's so important, is because if you can't love yourself, they're going to be honest. You can't accept love from somebody else. Yes. I go, why? Because they say they love you. In your mind, you're going, well, they don't know me. Man, I know I'm not blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you'll push them away. And then you'll find yourself with nobody around. And guess what you'll say? You see? see? I'm not lovable. <laughs> like, oh, that was good. You, you just did prior. that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right? Uh, 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 and when it comes to, do I have any power the answer is no, it has been systematically deprived of them, okay? Uh, I got a minute, I got to say this because it's, it's, this is really cool. People, there's a power struggle in the world. It's always been this way. There are three levels of power. Number one, caveman. Who's the biggest badass with the biggest club? Whatever they say, do it. They are the, got the power. Evolution came along. There's people then that control the resources that you need and all of a sudden they say, well, if you want those resources, you got to give me something for this. And you know what? The ones that had the resources paid the caveman to hit you over the head if you didn't pay for the resources. Okay? You hit man. <laughs> that's, that, that's the king who owns the resources with an army of cavemen. Okay. And then I say, but the last of the power struggles came down to knowledge is power. And it was recognized that, yes, that is the supreme power of everything. Knowledge is power. The first thing the Church of Rome did is acknowledge we are the source of infallible knowledge. We are the source of truth. We say it, it's true. What you say, I don't care. So the point about it was people gave up their power to the belief. And I say it in here very quickly. There's a code behind the power brokers. I call it the power mongers credo. I say, what is it? You ready? Give them the fear for free and then sell them the antidote. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by read.
I'm gonna die. What do you want me to do? Put a mask on? Sure, I gotta put a mask on. Yeah. You know? But I can't visit my mom who's dying in a nursing home. Now you have to give that up because um you can't do that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, really? and fear, and fear controlled and fear uh, created biology of uh, illness. I mean, it really, really is a, a great analogy. Um, Bruce, this has been so fun to dive deep. I love talking to you. I love your enthusiasm, love your wisdom. And I love most of all that you were so far ahead of the curve uh, <laughs> because people are kind of coming along to this belief. But the truth is you were the one of the very first ones writing, talking about this. And I'm just grateful that way back, in the day, in the lab that you saw this and, and started writing about it. Um, so we're super- I can't grateful. be any more happy than I am for myself. Yes. <laughs> I have this life. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A different life than before that discovery. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it transformed us all too. I have many stories, the same thing of me continuing to transform because of this knowledge. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for spending your time with us today.